I feel like a team down, I usually come on some fucking entrance music or something like that, but kids are in sleep and it's late and shit. I was half expecting uh, you to come back, like, you know, naked or something. Or <laughs> are, we, are we already there? with that desperate for viewers that are on OnlyFans? Fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> made, 40 P, made 14p last month on OnlyFans. Fucking hell, that was a good month. <laughs> it's a very niche market, that. <laughs> Only. <laughs> We're not quite yet there, brother. Um, how you doing, man, after the horror show today? I was having a really shit day. Uh, well, I, was, I, was having, I had a great day. And yeah. uh, the first time in ages, I had two hours and the kids, you know, they said, all right, daddy, if you do this for me till four o'clock, then you can have the TV. You won't be disturbed or anything. I thought, oh, this is bliss. This is bliss. And then I sat down and watched two hours of the worst bit of football I've ever had. And then... And then I thought, I'm going to go for a nap because I am sulking. And I woke up at quarter past nine and saw that Liverpool had been beat by seven goals to two by Aston Villa. And the world just gets more and more fucking mental. It does get more and more mental. And we're going to discuss this. The latest episode of 2020 is fucking Chicken Oriano um, <laughs> tonight. Um <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that. I've never heard that one before. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I usually go with the Radio Rentals one, but it's a bit out of date now, and no one knows what Radio Rentals is. No. Um, yeah, show me age. Um, that's Scott. That's Scotty. I'm Moe. This is Scotty and Moe. This is episode number. I don't know. 19, I think, maybe. It might be more. Though. We've done a lot of top fives. It, it, we're into. We, we're doing about two dozen. Uh, uh, the latest edition of our podcast. Well, we're going to be talking about just what's going down in the ghetto. Um, Scotty, talk to me. What's been happening, mate? It's been a big week, hasn't it? Well, uh, Donald Trump has uh, left the White House and gone into hospital because after a year of saying the sort of playing down what the coronavirus was, suggesting that you can defeat it with vitamin D and Dettol, uh, he's finally caught COVID himself and he's in hospital. Pretty Patel has opened up her new tourist venture and is now sending migrants uh, to a one-star hotel on uh, Ascension Island, which is 3,000 miles away from the country. Uh, Boris, but from this country, Boris Johnson's dad uh, is defying his son's laws, much like most of his cabinet, and is refusing to wear a mask uh, and has been caught with six people, more than six people on his house, as is Jeremy Corbyn. We've had Scottish MPs that had coronavirus and decided to travel on a fucking train from London back to Scotland. It just goes on and on and on. And whilst I want this year to end, it is pure ammunition for the likes of me and Jay. Where do you want to start? <laughs> um, mate, there's, there's quite a lot to get through there. Um, we'll start with his royal Trumpness. Yep. Um, he's got he's got the Rona or COVID, whatever you want to call it, or as he'd call it, the I hate China disease. Um, as you said, didn't wear a mask, hasn't been wearing a mask, rarely wears a mask, now and again he will. Downplayed it, at one point said that there was 15 cases in the US and he expected them to be down to nothing within a week. Um, that was 200,000 deaths ago. Um, and now on Wednesday, I think he was diagnosed or it came out, he'd been diagnosed with it. Um, and then he was took to Walter Reed Hospital. Doing quite well because he paid seven hundred and fifty dollars in taxes, and yet he's getting thousands of pounds or thousands of dollars worth of medical attention. So socialism's working for him. <laughs> um, I mean, the sort of the funny thing is with, with this whole Trump thing is, you know, I've seen like Biden suspended his campaign or he's a negative ads. I've seen people saying you need to rise above it, you need to wish him well. Um, you know. At the end of the day, he's still the president. He's still a 70-odd-year-old man who's got a fatal, a potentially fatal disease. Um, and we should, you know, we should be better than than that and not take the piss and not, you know, wish him death or anything like that. And I'm not wishing him death. I want him to survive and I want him to get beat off Joe Biden in the election. But I'm not going to fucking show him any sympathy. I mean, this is a guy that mocked a disabled reporter when he was running for president last time round. He's the one that mocked Hillary Clinton when she had pneumonia, mimicked her and mocked her. He calls, he constantly has jibes about Joe Biden being old, sleepy Joe, he calls him. Nancy Pelosi, I think he calls her, I forget what he calls her, he's got another nickname for her. He he constantly mocks people. He's constantly downplayed this virus. He's he's just been an absolute car crash when it comes to it. As you mentioned earlier, he advised people to more or less get on a sunbed and inject bleach. Um, 
to combat it. I mean, he's actively caused death with his actions. Yeah. And now we're meant to feel sorry for him because he's got it. And, you know, I don't feel sorry for him. I don't wish him ill. I just don't give a shit, if I'm being brutally honest. Um, I'm not going to show him any sympathy. Like I said, I hope he survives and I hope we go into this election and I hope Joe Biden absolutely wipes the floor with him. Do you think that that will happen, though? Because I was talking to some friends about this. When Boris Johnson got coronavirus, after he was going around high-fiving uh, people, sufferers like uh, the lunatic he is, um, and surprisingly caught it, as most of his cabinet did, um, there was a bit of sympathy from both the left and right uh, in England. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't uh, Boris didn't get a get-well card from Scott. Uh, but, you know, there, there were people oh, that... Oh, my. Oh, my. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure you get that in there, Jay. Uh <laughs> there, there, there were people that, that were sympathising with him because they were saying, like, oh, he's, you know, he's having to fight through this and he's trying to take the country through. Uh, and, you know, the, I, felt, I felt the pressure from maybe the media wasn't on him so much. And now we're looking, what, are we three weeks away from the actual electoral campaign, uh, the, the presidential presidential election? Uh, do you think that that may swing things in his favour by any stretch? Well, you make a very good point. Uh, I'll just pick up on a couple of differences that I see. I'm not, you know, an authority on this, and you may disagree, or other people may disagree. I think with Boris Johnson, there were several things. One, it was quite early-ish in the development of the sort of what was happening with Corona. It yeah. was a few weeks in, wasn't it, that it had become a, a real pandemic, and I think we sort of realised the seriousness of it. And then just a few weeks in, he gets it. So there's that sort of for want of a better word, freshness about it. And wow, it's, you know, it's everywhere. Even the prime minister's got it. The honeymoon period. Yeah, the honeymoon period. Yeah, the honeymoon. <laughs> never mind the incubation period. The, the COVID honeymoon period. There you go. Oh. Um, but there's oh. that. There was the fact that Johnson was still relatively new in the job. It was, you know, the general election wasn't that long ago. So he hadn't had four years of divisive politics of pushing everyone. I mean, he's had a few months of it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a Johnson fan by any stretch. He's caught up a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's made up for lost time. You're absolutely <laughs> right. So there was that. I think if I can get my sort of slightly Brexit hat on, I think we do have sometimes this sort of, you know, rally round the flag sort of British Dunkirk attitude that is a bit misplaced at times. And it's like, oh, he's, he's the prime minister. He's ill. Well, come on, we've all got a rally behind him, you know, Rule Britannia and all that sort of stuff. Um, flag shaggers. Like, flag shaggers, that's a great expression. Um, but I saw an interesting comment from, uh, I think it was Dan Hodges, who's a right-wing political commentator, but he actually, he speaks quite a lot of sense, not all, all of it, um, but he said, the fact that usually in America, they're massive for rallying around the flag. They are flag shaggers. Oh, know. mate, orgies no. of, of cotton. Yeah, George, orgies of cotton. <laughs> <laughs> An absolute <laughs> fucking threesome of polyester. Oh, it's, um, like, it's like ancient, ro ancient Greece yeah, over ancient there. Greece, oh, yeah, I've got a corner each. It's <laughs> honestly, it's absolute scenes. Um, but yeah, the Americans just they rally around the flag more than anyone. You know, you look at 9 11, for example, Bush's approval rating was terrible, even though he's only been in the job a little bit. Once that happens, his approval rating goes through the roof because everyone rallies around the president in a time of crisis, which I get. I'm not having a dig at them for that. Um, and normally with something like this, you, they would they would rally around him. They'd be like, okay, he's ill, you know, he's the president, no matter what, even if you're not a massive Trump fan, you've got to get behind him. But he's sort of, the point that Dan Hodges was making, and I sort of agree, he's devalued the office that much over four years that the presidency doesn't seem to have that same sort of reverence that it had in the past. You know, you've got a president who threatens people, who insults people on Twitter, who says things on Twitter that me and you wouldn't even say. We wouldn't say the things he says. Do you know what I mean? He constantly uses insults. He constantly has uh, sort of nasty comments. You know, I mentioned the fact that when he was campaigning, he was mocking Hillary when she was early, not the disabled reporter. Once he got pre became president, he got even worse. You know, the language that he uses, the, the things that he does, I mean, he he sort of undermined the, the aura of the, the office. You know, you, you, the Americans in general have always had this sort of, okay, no matter what you think, it's the presidency. It's, you know, he is the commander in chief. He is the, the, the guy we elected. And there is a sort of, you know, majesty to that office. Do you know what I mean? Like, there is. But he's got rid of all that in four months, uh, four years, sorry. He's just sort of erased it. So now he just comes across as like this sort of um, reality TV star firing shots at people at two o'clock in the morning on Twitter. 
So I don't think that people have that same sympathy or empathy for him. The fact that he's been so horrible to so many people is undermining him. The fact that he's downplayed the disease in a way that Johnson, even Johnson, all right, he slightly did with the whole herd immunity thing, but he backtracked on that and he and then he tried to hammer home the, the importance of it and how serious it was and lockdown and all that other stuff. Trump's, even when he was in lockdown, he was campaigning almost against his own lockdown, sending yeah. out tweets like freedom and liberty and all this shit. So I think for all those factors, he's not getting the the poll bump that he should because, you know, in a different world or a different time or a different, he'd have been different. Right now, people would have been all around him. They'd have been having candlelit vigils and, you know, crying and they'd have been like, you know, pray for the president and be trending and, and all this other stuff. I mean, it might be for all I know because there might be still a lot of right-wingers that are for that. But um, he, there isn't that because of him, because of his personality and what he's done. And it's like, you know, you can't have it both ways. You can't do all the things that I've mentioned. And then when you get that, because of your yeah. own stupidity as well. I'm not saying everyone that catches COVID is stupid. They're not. But he's literally done everything you shouldn't have done. He's not worn yeah. a mask. He's held rallies. He's had people in, 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 in the same room who have tested positive. I mean, it's just an absolute shambles. And the fact that he's it's taken him this long to get it is probably the only surprise. Yeah. It's like going on the Club 80 to fur. Uh, and shagging about and not wearing a condom and not expecting to get chlamydia, you are going to get burned. And that's exactly what happened the way he was sort of going through coronavirus. But when you make the comparison to Boris Johnson, he, um, Boris sort of bumbled his way through it. And he, he, I know he's, we, we can look around at the back of Boris Johnson. You've got Dominic Cummins, the puppet master. Um, Trump has been a lot more sadistic and evil in his, I don't evil might be strong, but sadistic in any sort of ways that I'm approaching and stuff. And he does seem to go back on the advice that he was given, like, like he said, going against lockdown and stuff. Do you think it was, I didn't want to get all fucking Ian Brown with it, with Tim Foyle, but it was fucking convenient timing, mate. Um, it was. You, you, on, on, the, on the back of the, the $750 tax that, he, that he's paid, uh, after him doing that, um, debate which turned into a farce uh, both me and you stayed up till two in the morning to watch him just talk over joe biden yeah i'm not gonna let you finish any single sentences and then he gets true. corona and then he gets coronavirus two days later and it looks like he's probably not gonna have time now i imagine to do any more debates you'd think although, although there's rumors today that he might actually go back into the white house tomorrow uh but there's been contrast aren't there, in terms of how actual how ill he actually is he didn't look well when he did his video, did he? Um, I know what you mean. It is slightly convenient. I think the whole Melania voice recording as well about when she was saying, give me a fucking break about the kids getting separated from the families didn't help. Um, that that had been a, another sort of blow to the campaign. And Melania's always been sort of viewed as, I don't know, maybe a, a decent person who just happens to be going out with this megalomaniac, for want of a better word. Um, but then she showed the true colours on that audio recording where she just basically didn't give a shit about these kids who'd been separated from families and was against Christmas rather sort of bizarre, sort of Alan Rickman in Robin Hood. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, nice one. Um, so there was that and then almost the sudden. So, yeah, I mean, I get where you're coming from. I think, I just think, to be honest with you, he's been that reckless. Yeah. It was only a matter of time. Um, and I think, I mean, there was suspicions, wasn't there, when Johnson got it, did he actually have it? I've seen yeah. a few people saying that because, again, that was sort of convenient in a way. But I, I just think these people have just taken too many chances. I think they've not practised what they preach in terms of social distancing, in terms of wearing a mask, in terms of not contacting people that may be infected. We have. We've done pretty much what we should have been, of what we've been asked to do. I think the ones that haven't have been over-exaggerated and overplayed in the media. Um, and I think we'll get to it in a minute. The message has been that confusing, especially in the UK, that even the, the Prime Minister himself and his advisors and the websites, the, the, the government websites, the official websites, don't make much sense. So, no. uh, you know, we've sort of told the, the party line, ironically, um, and they haven't, and that's how they've ended up getting it. I don't think, I, I think, yeah, you know, I wouldn't be that amazed if it turned out that it was a hoax. I just don't think it is. I just think it's more... In recklessness, to be honest with you. Yeah, no, I, I just, I just thought I'd throw a little conspiracy no, theory in there. I've heard just it a few John times, mate. I've heard it a few times, mm. to be honest with you. I heard it with Boris Johnson, um, and a lot of people saying it with Trump as well. You know, I mean, let's face facts; it's not the most ridiculous conspiracy theory we've had recently. Um, but <laughs> I think we've been a bit too kind for him thinking it's designed. I think that that fucking stupid. 
that yeah. just caught it despite being in the most powerful offices in the in the Western world and having all the opportunities to avoid it. Um, and it just, you know, we spoke about it before. It amazes me how two people in mean, Trump and Johnson who've had literally hundreds of thousands of sp pounds spent on their education can be so fucking thick. Indeed. And what was so the one? Let's bring it back over here then. We're talking about the, the guidelines because it came out this week that um, Boris, is, what's Boris Johnson's dad called again? Stanley, is it? St uh, yeah, Stanley Johnson. Um, the apple does not far far from the tree uh, on that one. But he's not been following his own son's advice. Uh, there was a picture in the paper today about when he was at the barbers or re reading something and the mask was below the, below the neck. If you can't get your own dad to follow your advice as Prime Minister, do you remember, my, my dad doesn't listen to me at the best of times, but you know, when you're trying to set an example, you, the one thing like, Dad, just, just do a solid day, Dad. <laughs> I, really, I really need you not to go to Greece. <laughs> just, just, yeah. Just do it. Go next year, I'll send you, we'll put it on expenses. We can do that with the Tory government, easy, right? Just stay in your doors, don't have more than five people around. We're laughing, do you know what I mean? But it just, that, that just, when your own dad can't understand the advice or doesn't want to follow it, how the fuck are you expecting the general public to do it? And again, it's just leaked this evening that uh, they're going to be bringing in this new tier, uh, free tier system of lockdown. Again, where they're going to be changing, like, so on new local lockdowns, you're either going to be on tier one, tier two, tier three. You can also have uh, lemon and herb, hot, very spicy. Uh, you, do you know what I mean? It's just, can, what, I, I, like, when it got to scatter graphs, I can't work any, any of the bar charts out or what the numbers mean or anything anymore. It really is like I'm just staring into the matrix and I've got a fucking clue what's going on. But they're going to be bringing in new legislation this week. And it just, for me, it seems like we are heading into a lockdown. It just seems inevitable that we're doing that and we're trying to do everything not to do that. And I just think it seems counterproductive. Why don't we not just the disease lasts for two weeks. Now, I'm not a scientist, I, 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 and if, if people out there have more, like, now than me, I'm, you know, please po post it at the bottom, but it lasts for two weeks, roughly. If you shut down the majority of the country for two weeks, don't let any fucker in, don't let any fucker out, and obviously you'll have hospitals and emergency services, but we should have the testing equipment now to deal with that, to make sure you can test people who are going in and out of hospital. Is that not the best thing, and then just carry on? Because Israel are doing that at the moment, and I know, I know that they're getting protests about it but I, it just, by just doing all this asking around and just pussyfooting that's what it's like you know but oh we'll just try this and so we don't have to do a lockdown oh that's not worked we'll just try that because the local lockdowns haven't worked the numbers are up today there's been a massive fuck up with the numbers because fifteen thousand test results didn't get put all out over the last three days have you seen so have you seen the test results that have come out today so the number mm -hmm. of confirmed taste com confirmed cases today is the highest it's ever been uh, since the pandemic began and it's come out twenty one thousand confirmed uh, cases today and that's because of the knock on effect because they've got the testing trace and so bad that they're still bringing stuff back from the 29th of September or something when that should have been a while ago so they're just like the, so the, the numbers aren't correct and this is what I mean, the, 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 the muddied the waters are so bad, it's looking like Blackpool Beach. Fucking hell, mate. I mean, <laughs> I mean <laughs> that's as it. We saw it the other day, um, I was touched on this when I spoke to you earlier, about, you know, Boris Johnson did a series of interviews, didn't he? I don't know if you saw him on Friday. He did regional interviews. Um, from what I gather, he did four and a half minutes to reporters from the region. So... He did four and a half minutes with someone from Yorkshire, four and a half minutes with someone from the Northwest, four and a half minutes with someone from the Midlands, etc. Um, I think I think it was in Downing Street. I might be wrong, um, but it looked like it was in a room in Downing Street. Um, I think it was Hannah Miller. He did it for ITV um, for the Northwest. Fantastic journalist. Always asks the right questions. She, she was the one who did the great interview in Oldham with Tommy Robinson, where she just absolutely tore him apart. Um, and she's always good stuff. And she, the thing is, right, she was asking him questions and he didn't have the answers. The guy from Yorkshire was asking him questions. He literally didn't have the answers. He was saying, I'll get it to you. Can we get Can we get this? Can we find this out? Can we, I'll get them figures for you. And now people go, well, how's he meant to know? Like me and you sat in a room and you said, right, Scotty, what are the figures for Kettering? What's the policy in Northampton? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you're not going to know that. But the point is, and I've got some experience with this, is when you do a, an interview with um, the Prime Minister, I haven't interviewed Boris Johnson, I interviewed David Cameron a few times when he was Prime Minister, and I'm guessing, I don't know because I wasn't there, but I'm guessing, and I'm almost certain that this is how it would work with Johnson, is you'll give him the questions or you'll let him know at least what region you're from. Yeah. So 
he'll be briefed. So when Cameron, the first time I interviewed him was in Lancashire, there were six of us who did a huddled interview with him. We all had questions. We gave him the questions first of the topics and he was briefed. So when I asked him a question or when someone asked him a question about Preston bus depot, which was like a listed building in Preston that everyone was up in arms about getting demolished. He knew about it. Now, do you think David Cameron automatically knows the history of Preston yeah. bus station? Of course he fucking doesn't. Do you know what I mean? Someone else asks him about the crime in Rosendale and he knows the answer or he knows a answer, even though it's yeah. bland. Do you think he knows about crime in Rosendale? Fucking hell, no. People in Rosendale don't even know the answer to that one. So, you know, he was briefed and it was the same again when the Chancellor came to Manchester and we had him at the Graphene Institute. Again, he knew the questions or the topics at least. He was briefed. So Boris Johnson would have been briefed. He would have been told, right, you're in with someone for Yorkshire now. These are the facts and figures from Yorkshire. He didn't know them. You're in with someone from the North West now. These are the rules in, in, in Manchester. These are the rules, in, you know, this is what's going down. And he didn't have the answers. He just, he just fucking clueless. Now, that's either poor advice from his advisors, which I think is being kind to him. It's either him being too fucking lazy to read the advice he's given or to take it in, or being too arrogant to think he needs to know it all and just can bluster his way through like he does with any interview and any sort of comment. He just seems to, you know, mess his hair up a bit and make a few jokes um, and everyone fucking goes along for the ride. It's all, it's jovial, funny, buffoonery, Johnson. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not fucking funny. You know, to quote the Smiths, that joke isn't funny anymore because there's people dying. So it was just really, really irritating for me. And I thought, you know, four and a half minutes is not nearly long enough to ask the Prime Minister questions about a, a pandemic in your region with all these different rules going on all these different stats you want to get to the different approaches especially manchester where you can go i think it's if you drive across greater manchester there's four different types of lockdown or something restrictions yeah. in different boroughs you know i don't i know i don't know what the exact boroughs are i mean i'm not the fucking prime minister i've not been briefed on it but i think you know in oldham it's different to salford and, and that shit but he didn't know he just didn't know and it's just like it's embarrassing and then you know he was on my today and again it's just you know, it was like speed dating. I was just firing question after question at him without really getting into it with him properly. Do you know what I mean? It was yeah, like yeah, he yeah. was in a rush to just get as many questions in as he could. Um, and it's just, you know, it's just shambolic. You're not getting anywhere. And you've got the Prime Minister sat there and you're asking him and telling him this doesn't make sense. And a and point that Hannah Miller made, I think one of the points she made was the infection rate now in Oldham or, or when it, when lockdowns restriction or when restrictions started in Oldham, I think she said, forgive me, I'm getting this quite a little bit wrong, is sort of lower than it is in his own constituency. Yet there's no restrictions in his own constituency. And he couldn't answer it. It's just he hasn't got an answer for that. So why are you re putting restrictions down in parts of the North West when the infection rate is lower than your own constituency? Why are you yeah. not doing it in your own constituency? Maybe it's because those people voted for you. Maybe it's because you fucking got to deal with them people more on a regular basis. Maybe it's because, you know, you just give a shit more about the the the, the feelings of those people and the economy of that area. And maybe in, in up north, you know, where we all throw stones at the moon, you're not really asked. Yeah. And it's like, that, that, you know... Yeah, that's, that, that, that's exactly what it seems. There's no maybe about it, mate. It's just, <clears throat> it's just blase, isn't it? He just walked in and thought, like, I'll just bumble my way through these interviews. It's more like a, a token gesture. Rather than rather than coming to inform people that, uh, by and large, uh, their lives are depending uh, whether it's uh, their physical, their or their economy, you know, or their, their their life, their quality of life is based on the decisions that are made by him and his government. I seen it on my this morning. There's another question was saying, well, local lockdowns aren't working, Boris, because the numbers uh, are rising now in many in loads of areas where there's local lockdowns, and he's just bumbled his way through that. And one thing that really does my nut in when it gets the you know when they when they do the the interview with the the fucking medical people? Is it Valence and the kind uh, of my Valence and Whittle? Is it? It's Whitty, sorry, yeah, it's Whitty, yeah, that, that Valence, yeah, yeah. And um, they allowed like one question from certain people, but they're not allowed a follow up question. So what they do is they just they deter it. They're just like, right, well, I'll, I'll address part of your question and then i'll go left field and, and then you can't follow up saying well can you actually answer the question please boris i asked you rather than giving me some statistic i didn't need and then you just seem to deviate from what people are, are, are putting down the question that i put into them all the time and it really, no. i mean you must have experience from that as a journalist that the follow-up questions yeah you need follow-up questions you know it's, it's it was so frustrating for me when they did the um the daily briefings just watching it and just seeing that People were getting one question, it wasn't getting answered, and they weren't getting a follow-up. 
you know, it's it's. I've been in that situation before where you you try to ask a follow up question or you want a follow up question and you don't get it, and you, the question you've originally asked hasn't been answered. I mean, I haven't been on it on the scale of, of what you saw there, but I've had it in other interviews. And so, yeah, you know, to a certain degree, when we've interviewed the Chancellor or the Prime Minister, I remember once when we did a huddle with George Osborne, who was the uh, Chancellor at the time, and Jen Williams from the MEN, who's one of the best journalists around, she asked him a question. He didn't answer it. They tried to take him out of the room, and she stopped. She looks almost stood in his way <laughs> and was like, <laughs> I want an answer to this question. You haven't answered it. What is the answer? Really, really? And fair play to her, she got one. But it was just like, you know, slightly bizarre scene when you see uh, the Chancellor being confronted by Jen's only like five foot four or whatever. She's only signing a um, local reporter, like almost having to stop him. And there was another time with George Osborne where he came to Asda and we had to give him the questions in advance. He comes in, he answers them looking at the floor and he's sort of like he's autistic. He has this habit of doing that, George Osborne. He looks down on the floor, talks to the floor like that, which is just weird. Um, and then doesn't answer him in any sort of remotely substantial way. And, you, you know, he, he's dragged off before you can ans ask a follow-up or you're sort of shot down. And it was just like, it's just almost pointless. He's ticking a box, you know. The Prime Minister gave an interview. Well, did he? Do you know what I mean? Did he give an yeah. interview? Giving an interview to me is answering questions, not just fucking, you know, bumbling your way through and trying to be funny and not an not answering the, 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 the points that have been asked of you. So, yeah, it's, it's really frustrating, and I don't think we've ever had that sort of scrutiny. And it brings me on to a point I wanted to make as well, is that um, I don't know if you saw my tweet, but Matt Hancock, who, for me, is just an absolute fucking disgrace of a health secretary. Um, he was asked the other day in the Houses of Parliament, um, a, a Sikh MP um, asked him a question, and he had to go at him. He said, you know, I will not have this divisive language. I will not. and didn't answer the question. And this is the second time Martin Cox did this. You know, when it was the doctor, the Asian doctor, who asked him a yeah. question, the, the Labour MP. And he said, I think you should watch your tone. And I just think this is the arrogance of these people. I mean, you can get into an argument of well, whether that's based on the fact people of colour, for want of a better word, or, you know, are asking him questions. Maybe he's got an issue with that. I don't know. Um, but, you know, to sort of shut him down and tell him to watch the mouth, it's just ridiculous. Answer the questions that you've been asked. That's the whole point of Parliament is that MPs can scrutinise and can ask questions of the people that are in government. And to, to not even be able to do that, to not be able to ask follow-up questions on a briefing when we're dealing with the pandemic, to have the Prime Minister going on television, doing regional interviews where he doesn't know his ass, his ass from his elbow, is just an absolute disgrace. Yeah. Matt Hancock to health is what Ed Woodward is to football, mate. He's fucking useless. Um, but I, I make a good point. Did you see the Lawrence Fox thing that's come out this evening? Oh, God, no. What now? Oh, this, this will be fucking laugh. Well, uh, as we talk about politics on the Scotty and Mike show, as we do now have a new political party called the Lawrence Fox Twat Political Party. I can't remember, I can't remember what it's actually called. It may as well be called that. Yeah. Um, but he, he's, he's boycotting Sainsbury's uh, because Sainsbury's put a, a tweet out saying that they're um, welcoming anyone uh, who, who, one minute, recognising the central role of black people have played in history. And then he's saying that he will no longer be going to the supermarket. Oh, sorry, he said it's the most inclusive retailer. Uh, and then he's, he's boycotting it, saying that um, he, he's going to reclaim British values. Let me get the actual fucking thing. Promoting racial segregation and discrimination after announced support for Black History Month. And he's asking so, his followers to do it. They promoted support for Black History Month. Yep. And his response to that is we're going to boycott Sainsbury's. Because that could, yeah, because he sees Black History Month as uh, something that is promoting uh, segregation. The thing that people have to remember about Black History Month is the, the other 11 months are pretty much White History Month. That's the fucking thing. Do you know what I mean? It's like on Friends where Ross and his, um, his, his ex-wife, who's now a lesbian, is about to have a baby. And her new, her new partner says, you know, there's, there's a Father's Day. There's no Lesbian Lover's Day. And he says, every day is Lesbian Lover's Day. And it's like <laughs> that with White History Month. We learn about history, a lot of it being, you know, I'm not white history's not fair, you know, just history in general, which a lot of it is a sort of white sort of base. Every day at school, you know, you learn about all that. I didn't learn about black history at school. I didn't learn about that, really. I didn't know, you know, 
you might have what a fucking half an hour on Martin Luther King if you're lucky in one of your lessons, or you know, bit of extracurricular activity. Yeah, yeah, yeah here, here you go. <laughs> yeah, do you know what I mean? I didn't know that certain <clears throat> cultural icons or that certain writers or that certain important figures were, you know, not white. Didn't learn that until after I left school. Do you know what I mean? When yeah. you do a bit of research. So the idea that, you know, this one month is a month too far is a fucking joke. And it's like, the, all he's done is he's found a niche in the market. This is a guy that is bang average at acting, just happens to be part of an acting family dynasty. Yeah, his career is doing okay. Do you know what I mean? He's, you know, the sidekick of Inspector Morse's sidekick. You know, so it's not... No, it's not terrible, but it's hardly yeah. fucking setting the world alight. His music career is absolutely dreadful. The only reason he's got a music career is because he's part of the acting family dynasty and he's got enough money from his acting and his other stuff to pay for his own record label and push out his content and get invited on places like, you know, This Morning or whatever to perform absolute dirge. Yeah. And um, But he still doesn't help his record sales because everyone who hears it doesn't want to buy it. And then he's found this sort of gap in the market for himself where he went on question time, accused someone who asked him about racism of being racist, or at the same time saying that racism doesn't exist. I'll yeah. let you unpick that one because that makes no sense to me. Um, and he's now a sort of Tim Pot fucking Waitrose version of uh, Nigel Farage. Do you not think that? Yeah. Uh, have, have, um, have you seen The Wizard of Oz? Yes. Right, you know when the Wicked Witch gets the, the fucking, the house landed on her head and then they've got yes. the, 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 the slippers. He just seemed that, like, we did a podcast about maybe three months ago where the Wicked Witch died and we had poppers and stuff. He's just put Katie Hopkins' slippers on and just walked down the yellow brick road towards Sainsbury's protesting like his fucking Rosa Parks. <laughs> and that's what he's doing. He's just basically going for that Katie Hopkins quid that, and, and, and that's what he's doing. I, You know, how anyone can sort of see themselves as being credible and not laughed off the face of the fucking country or the planet by protesting against Sainsbury's because all they're doing is supporting a historical a month that, uh, that celebrates the history of a race of people whose history is, was all but fucking blown off the face of the earth apart from maybe 250 years about it Ma majority of black people's history were written by white people do you know what i mean exactly. that, that, that that needs to be acknowledged and this is another thing i wanted to talk about was the the thing that came out this week where they're trying to abolish what books we can this is fascism i don't give a fuck right we're this is a cultural war that we're in it's now it's with, 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 with the Tory government, because we're talking a week about how they're trying to get uh, very right-wingers in the BBC, uh, militant right-wingers doing Ofcom, and now they're coming for our kids with school where you're not allowed to have any sort of books that are, that are promoting uh, or and that are doing anti-capitalism. We're not allowed to have anything that sort of challenges the government, and they're trying to take all these books around from our kids, so they're trying to feed our kids all sort of it's propaganda that's that, that that's all it is and i just find it absolutely it's terrifying and then get to fuck because as soon as my daughter's 12 she's reading george orwell george orwell's 1984 and i'll be making i find her a beret mate and then just turn into a max just for the fucking love of it <laughs> but you can, it's, just, it's absolutely absurd that they can do this and i i, tr I know i don't want to get all ian brown the, the tim for all that but this does feel like a cultural war and, and it does feel very much like uh, Gepetto, the puppet master, has got you know is pulling the strings there, where he's trying to create a, a country that has a culture where we decide what information our kids have, what news is given on our main mainstream um, British Broadcasting Corporation, who controls that, and all we're going to be left with is shit books in school and Mrs Brown's boys on bleeding TV, and that's it. That's an absolute scary thought mrs brown's boys on tv that's actually worse than a completely fascist agenda to be honest with you i think i'd rather read mine mind, mind camp than uh watch mrs brown's boys not that i'm advocating uh hitler in any way shape or form um yeah. but no you're right mate the, the irony is you know you have people like lawrence um fox saying you know this is a cultural war rah, rah, rah. it's a cultural war where you know you're moaning about one month out of 12 you're moaning about there being some different views on the BBC. By and large, most of the views you want are mainstream media. The two biggest selling newspapers in this country are right wing. Most of the, the main commentators in this country, political commentators, are, are, are right wing. You know, there's the sort of 
the the idea that the left or liberalism is going out of control and it's infiltrating everything, it's just a nonsense. It's just not true. You, yeah. you know, you're fighting a war that you've already won, really. And it's like the problem is you just don't want any counter view. It's not that you don't want too much of it. You don't want any. You don't want the one month a year. You don't want the one voice on the BBC that might tweet something left wing. You don't want any of that. You want it to be a complete, like you say, a fascist right wing sort of propaganda nation where we all get up in the morning. We uh, Big Brother comes on the telly. And I don't mean the, the Channel 4 show um, or Channel 5. I think it is now. It tells you how wonderful this country is and how we're going to war with Eurasia. Um, and we all do, you know, praise Big Brother, salute him, and then fucking go about our day <laughs> full of vigour because we're proud to be English. It's a nonsense. You know, we spoke about it in the past that like, we're turning to V for Vendetta. And it does feel like that. And I think that this idea, you know, that some sort of <sighs> part-time actor, because he seems to have given up a lot of acting to take up fucking insanity, um, is going to change things by boycotting bloody Sainsbury's is completely fucking ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, well, fuck him. I'm, I, I, I don't agree with his agenda regarding because with the culture that he's fighting against is the one that I want to see the kids have the kids reading in school. But they're saying that there's um, you're not allowed to have a book that publicly state desire to abolish or overthrow democracy, capitalism, or to end free and fair elections. Are we going to start burning books now? Is that the next stage? Are we actually yeah, going to go for fucking it, national socialism? It is like V for Vendetta, though. It's like where um, the, the Stephen Fry character where he gets killed because he's got a copy of the Quran in his in, in, in his basement, and that and, and that's why it's like, how can you how how can you stop young people uh, reading books? And I wouldn't mind if the school curriculum offered an honest approach or like a, a nuanced catalogue of books for young people but we're still teaching fucking british empire and colonies as being a good thing we don't teach black history uh, you know I, 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 we had blue peter in uh the youth center that, that, that i've worked at sometimes that did last week and then um, they were doing the blue peter badge about what it means to be british in um in 2020 and this must have caused fucking uproar because it got the union jack but instead of it being the blue peter badge they put the uh windrush uh the, the Boat. and Outrage. then they had lots of, yeah, they had lots of this. So, 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 you know, so it was really multicultural representation. And the, and the, and the two girls who were the artists there were black, and they were saying when they went to school, they didn't have any uh, black history teachings. So we used to get like when some kids would go to Alton Towers, they were taken to black history museums in London and give a load of chicken. And that's their words. I'm not taking, I'm not taking that out of context. And it was only the black kid because and because they felt it was only appropriate, right? that the black kids go to this because it isn't important for the white kids. So I would, you know, if, if that was me in that school, I'd have come back to school. I, right, well, why the fuck am I listening to white history? This ain't nothing to do with me. I'm white. You know, I, I don't need to be in this. I don't need to hear about, you know, I don't need to hear about Churchill. What? Fuck you. Mate, we had, the, we had it at school. Do you know what? You're right, because I remember it was like the, the empire where the sun never sets on the empire and how wonderful it was. And it was sort of downplayed the fact that Churchill, you know, was part responsible for the death of millions of uh of Indians in the Bengali famine, or that you know, the, 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 this empire was built on basically you know enslaving people, and you know even that like Britain <laughs> helped abolish slavery was given this the sort of pie line, you know, but it also helped to create it. You know yeah. these wars that were, were so sort of reverent of and, and proud of up until I'd argue I'd argue you know the Second World War I get and um, defeating that Nazism, but the other wars you know the Boer War, the, even to a certain extent the First World War. You know the, the the wars throughout with France and and the the American War of Independence and stuff like that. These aren't anything for Britain to be proud of. These no. is, this is just you know this is just us going to countries which has got fuck all to do with us, and then just trying to take what we can from it. And when when the locals have kicked off or other um, imperialist nations who also fancy a claim to that bit of land have kicked off. Then, then you know we've we've gone to war with him. I mean, even like Zulu, you know Zulu, how fucking you know heroic were they in that little fucking fort? Michael Caine and Stanley, uh, is it Stanley Baker or Stanley Baxter? I was getting mixed up. Uh, Stanley Baker, thinking it. Um, and they, you know, they're fighting against all the Zulus and they're killing them all, and it's they, they survive, you know, in the end, the Zulus show them respect and leave them. So basically, they're in the middle of the the Zulus country. They massacre thousands of them for no fucking reason whatsoever other than they think they own that. And yet it's portrayed as like 
great British patriotism, how we a great success and a victory against the odds. Well, it's not, is it? Do you know what I mean? It's like me going to fucking the middle of, I don't know, pick a country anywhere. Do you know what I mean? Estonia. And just shooting everyone in sight and saying, this is my land now. You'd be like, we yeah. lost the fucking plot. You need to be, you know, imprisoned. But we, we celebrate it like it's sort of yeah. something to be proud of. And it's not. And, and 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 we have, and then people wonder why can racism and um, you know still still survive in this age when when we are framing the our history through that lens through the lens that empire was a good thing, then by and large you have you know how how much work have you got to do with the young people as it is when they've got that much culture around them through stories and stuff because we talk we talk on many of our top fives how black people are certain seen as a certain light in a lot of a lot of Hollywood films. That's only maybe maybe turn in a slight corner, you know, and that's gonna be like the Titanic's fucking turn that around. You know, that that, that that's you know, I mean that didn't end well to be honest, but I hope it's better than <laughs> I hope it's better than that. But you can when, you know, um, go when I had to do homeschooling, we did about VE day. And I remember um, I had the, the sheet and it said, you know, when uh, Hitler died there were celebrations across britain and i remember me um my daughter was like oh that he hitler died he died and everyone was celebrating that's not very nice and i was like no no he was a very you know nasty man and he was responsible for you know killing lots of people and my son pipes up and he went if i saw hitler i'd kick him in the privates and i thought <laughs> homeschooling is not for me <laughs> <laughs> I was like, right, okay, let's move on. <laughs> but you know, in Germany, in Germany, they don't, they don't. I mean, there's no way they could hide from the Second World War. But they teach it as being an abhorrent for the abhorrent thing it was. You know what I mean? They try to learn from their lessons. And for me, Germany is a more forward-thinking country in, in, in that sense than we are. Why are we still teaching values from the Victorian age as, as though they were a great thing? Why, why, why is that still acceptable? And yet you're looking at other books where you're not allowed to have, um, where, where they're challenging other books, but why are we not challenging the, the Empire curriculum? It's, I don't know. It's, it's mad, and, you know, we had this, didn't we, when Michael Gove was uh, in charge of education where he wanted to get rid of, like, To Kill a Mockingbird and all this other stuff, mm. and he wanted to bring out... You know, to teach, I don't know, fucking whatever, just, you know, Henry V or whatever, something more patriotic and, you know, once more, onto the breach, dear friends, once more, and all that sort of stuff, and not anything that might be culturally significant or, you know, give you a broader scope or, you know, one of the great books of, of, of our time, one of the greatest books ever, if not the greatest book ever, you know, you want to get rid of it. And it's like, what are you even on about? Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to deprive children of reading an amazing piece of literature that could open their minds or encourage them even to to, to take up that sort of craft? It's just nonsense, you know. We just, we just sort of we always seem to find a new low to sink to, like yeah. you say. You know, do I want my kids being taught? Do I want my kids being taught only black history? No, I don't. I want them to be taught history. Part of that history is black history. Part of that history is not. I want them to have, you know, a broad scope, and I want it to be taught honestly. So when you say Britain had an empire, how did it acquire the empire? What did that entail? What became of it? Why did we have it? That sort of thing. Not yep. we liberated India or we fucking, you know, helped parts of Africa become civilised. Let's not kid ourselves about what went on. You know, you've seen it recently with some of the statues getting torn down and people losing the shit over them. Why were they up for so long anyway? Why did it take physical response? Me and you spoke about it and sort of almost rioting to get rid of him. Why did someone many years ago not go, that guy was responsible for enslaving thousands of people. Let's not have a monument to him where yeah. lots of people walk past it. There was none of that. People had to physically grab it and throw it in the fucking river. I mean, it's ridiculous. And, you know, you've got to have more common sense and move with the times and be glad be glad and grateful that we are, um, in many ways, a more sort of, I don't know, more, a more curious generation, I'd say. You know, yeah. I think the generation now, because of the internet and everything else, does have more curiosity, perhaps, than, than maybe we did at school, because you've got all this information at your fingertips. You can find out things. Do you know what I mean? Like, when me and you were at school, if you wanted to learn something, you wanted to know something, you can't ask a teacher go and find a book now you can just google it do you know what i mean yeah. so you've got all that information and people maybe 
you know, I don't know if necessarily more curious, but it's easier for them to access the information. So why are we not giving them that information anyway in schools and teaching them, you know, this is what happened, this is why, why it happened, and these are the consequences of it. Why would you try and have a sort of, as you mentioned earlier, a fascist doctrine where you go, you know, the glorious triumphs of, of the British and the empire building and how we liberated these these lands. Yeah. It's nonsensical. You know what I mean? It, it, it really it really is, and it doesn't do anyone any favours. And I think far too often now you try to pit people against one another, so you're trying to say the, the liberals want to do this and, the, the you know, they want to do that, and it's not the case. You know, people just want a sort of a more fairer society and a more fairer education and a more honest society yeah. and a more honest education. That's all I want. You know, I want, I'm sure you're the same, mate. You want my kids to learn the truth. And I know that might sound yeah. slightly romantic, but it's also fucking, you know, it's, 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 it should be the minimum I'm demanding from their education. Yeah, I'm paying for it. You know, I, 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 you know yeah, it, it needs to be honest and open. And I, I wouldn't, uh, for, uh, on the flip side of it, I wouldn't want it to be all sort of lambasting or hating on Churchill and, and them sort of characters, you know what I mean? The, the, it, it, I want my children to grow up and be able to form an opinion of themselves, but it has to be a rounded opinion that they've got all the resources from different angles to come up with their own sort of uh, their only for their own frame and in how they see the world. Uh, but we shall see how that one pans out. Uh, next up, Pretty Patel has opened her own tourist board for immigrations, or she's planning to send them to two uh, British territories. Uh, which aren't part of England, the four thousand miles away from us. So when we talk about colonies and stuff like that, obviously they were never they were never our islands. But what uh, Pretty Patel is suggesting is that anyone that tries to come to this country seeking asylum, that they shall be shipped off to uh, the I think one of them is called the Ascension Island, four thousand miles away, and then housed there in some sort of makeshift fucking Guantanamo Bay for families that just want to flee war zones and she wants to house them in these places until they can either be given asylum in the uk uh, or then sent elsewhere and this seems to have stemmed from when that guy where what's his name the australian president because australia have a very similar um have a very similar thing tony abbott, them. The guy that's yeah advising yeah them. Yeah, Tony Abbott. So uh, Australia have a very similar thing back when people are trying to seek asylum in Australia, they house them off the coast of Australia. And it just seems to be complete. I, I understand people's beef with asylum and, and immigration. Uh, and, and I understand the, the, that people are frustrated by it because by and large, when people come to this country, whether they're seeking asylum or immigration, they, are, they are, tend to be put into one spot. Or, you know, into deprived areas that are already suffering. So when you've got Keith and Sunderland who wakes up and is upset and he sees, like, uh, he can't go to work, but he sees that a lot of uh, people from, I don't know, Syria on his street, they're the ones that he's pointing the finger to. But you don't see people from asylum in fucking leafy Hampshire. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, there's, there's enough of this country to go around, but they just congest, they, 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 they just um, they just put, the, they concentrate these, <clears throat> the, the asylum seekers in in one area. They even sent some to Liverpool. So to be honest, if Liverpool, if Liverpool fuck me Anfield or Ascension Island, four thousand miles away, your option. Fuck me, get me on that boat, mate. <laughs> fuck that. Um, but it's just absurd, and I just wanted to get get get, get your take on it. I, I, is this not barbaric? It is barbaric. Great word. Well, well said. Absolutely barbaric. You know, you can however you want to look at draconian, just evil anything around those lines it's just absolutely disgusting um like you say you know these there's, there's so many different points you can make on this argument these people are literally doing what they can to survive and i respect that i would do the same if my family was in danger and it meant getting on a fucking dinghy and going across the channel was a better option than staying where i was then i'd do that if that was you know the better option to try and keep my family alive i would do and this whole argument that you know it's the immigrants this it's immigrants that you know the immigrants are going to take our jobs and, you know, I mean, you look at how it, it contradicts itself. You know, they don't speak English. They're not, they're not educated. They don't, you know, they haven't got any skills, but they're going to take my job. Well, maybe you need to look at yourself then. If someone who's got no fucking skills, is not educated and don't speak English can take your job. Maybe you should fucking up your game. Do you know what I mean? Because that says more about you than it does about them. So this whole yeah. idea that it's the immigrants that we all need to be uh, worried about. It's not the immigrants that are dodging billions of pounds worth of tax. It's not the immigrants that have just got us into this sort of absolute pickle when it comes to the pandemic. It's the people that are in charge. They're the ones letting big business get away with fucking murder and get away with billions of pounds with not paying when they should be. They're the ones that are trying to rip apart the NHS bit by bit, not the immigrants. Immigrants put more into the NHS than they take out. 
I think it's yeah. about 11% of the NHS is from immigrant immigration, or it might be 20% or whatever, and like 8% is people from abroad using it. So you do the fucking maths. You take the immigrants out of the NHS, it doesn't it doesn't work anymore. It's not viable. So yeah. all these arguments are just so flawed. And like you just said there, you know, oh, we live on an island, oh, we're, you know, we're small in Texas. We've still got lots of land. We've still got lots of room. We can still have people coming in here. We can still have a proper immigration policy where you don't have to put them on a fucking boat and send them halfway across the world to what sounds like some sort of fucking prison island off Papillon or something. It yeah. just sounds absolutely horrific. And I think that this government, and Pretty Patel in particular, like I said earlier, always find new depths to plumb. Um, and she's just a awful, awful person. Yeah, it's like what I said to you, it's like what I texted you the other day about Donald Trump. Um, the only talent of Donald Trump and the Tory government is that they've managed to fucking limbo under the bar they keep lowering for themselves. And <laughs> poet, mate, this is why you're good at what you do. It's true. <laughs> you do, mate. You do. And the sad thing is, loads of people are stood around clapping them while they do it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You got to take a fucking stance on it, man, because it's just unacceptable. And I hope, I hope we've got a long four fucking years of this shit. We have with the Tories. We have. And I just hope people's memories aren't that short when it comes to the next general election. I know it's a long way off, and there's a lot yeah. that can happen between now and then. <clears throat> you know, and if the economy is booming by some miracle, um, yeah. then people may think, "Oh, they're not that bad, mate." That the just the you talk about the exact thing that they advocate and they propose and they say they're about British values and all that sort of stuff, which should be helping each other and sticking up for one another, and you know, just just sort of using the resources you've got to, to, to lend a helping hand. The exact opposite of what they're doing. They're just anyone yeah. that wants any help, we're not interested and we're going to shit you off and we're going to treat you like cattle. I mean, how is that even human to treat people yeah. like that? You know, and people need to take a stand. The press needs to take a stand. And when there's local elections, when there's any ele election, when there's, um, like, I know it's a long way after the next general election, the next general election, obviously, remember it. But, you know, you can make a difference. You can. I keep saying this to people, you know, there's, there's, you can join one of your local parties if, you, if you're not disillusioned with all the political yeah. parties. You can stand for office. You can, you can, you know, you can campaign. You can do all sorts. You can write a blog. You can do a video like what we do. You know, you can do a podcast. There's ways of getting your message out there. You don't have to work for a newspaper or be part of a, a political party. You can just, you know, let your voice be heard and let everyone know that you're not happy about it. And, you know, I'm not saying we make a massive difference but we you know there's what a thousand people subscribing to us now and we had yeah. you know we started a few months ago and everyone knows our views on everything and, and it's pretty much the same if, if we're left leaning and I don't make any bones about that but there's a way of just getting your message out there. and I think if enough people do that and show our discontent with this government then maybe I, again I'm being a little bit idyllic but maybe we can bring about some change because what's going on is just absolutely fucking horrendous and we're only at just the beginning of it. But you make you make a very good point in terms of like people need to be more vocal. But be more vocal amongst your colleagues at work and your friends in the street. Don't do it online because if you watch the social dilemma on Netflix recently, it'll Not just show you how it, yeah, it'll just show you how the algorithm you will only speak to the people that want to hear your opinion. This is true on right. Facebook, this is true on Twitter, this is true on Instagram. Only the people that are interested in them sort of views. You're not wanting to talk to them. You need to be talking to the people whose views you need to try and change. And you don't need to. I know we we can be quite vocal and um, swear and bad, abusive towards people who are right wing. But you don't change. We won't change anyone's mind that way. You need to sort of educate them uh, in a, in a threat friendly sort of way. I just wanted to touch on something. I got an email this week about someone who watched our um, podcast and they were saying they're going through a really shit time and uh, that our, that this uh, has helped them through the year because of like everyone's going through terrible times with, with COVID and stuff but they just couldn't see any light through the tunnel and they were thanking me and you for um for just trying to make light but also informative stuff so uh, you make a good point that people do actually watch and pay attention I just want to say to them that you're going through something we're all going through something when you're going through something there is always if you're going through something that means there's an end in sight you know and there's always people to talk to you and you know hit me up on the emails and stuff and i won't name you but thanks a lot for your email and um, meant a lot to get that but and everyone as well as well like 1050 subscribers uh we are going strong thank you everyone as always for subscribing tell your mates share the youtube channel on your social media make sure you can do that as well as tell them to vote for uh, other people <laughs> It's scary how more savvy you're getting at this now. You're sort of getting it. <laughs> it was like teaching my granddad at first. 
You were like, uh, press that button, the the sub, the the inscription, the ins the prescription thing. Yeah, do that. And now not you're just, like, not just a pretty face, Jay. Yeah. Not just a pretty. <laughs> Now you're like, hit subscribe, yeah, don't forget to share it. No, listen, um, I appreciate um, the, the guy getting in touch as well. And I'm glad that, you know, he, he enjoys what we do. And like you say, you know, we, we're just two middle-aged mank bastards who chat shit to each other. But it's nice when people listen to us. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If all, if all of the people that we lived with listen to I'm us. I'm just to the way you know, you know what? Hey, I'm standing in the <laughs> shouting and people walk past me like yeah. I'm not there. Like I'm one yeah. of the gold painted fucking human statues in Trafalgar Square. Yeah, so thank you, thank you for being yeah. our counselors. You know, yeah, you, have, you, made us feel, you made me feel valued. <laughs> um, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna do another one of these uh, very soon as well. I mean, it's, it's hard to keep up in it with all the, the guff that's going on, and also as Scotty mentioned the the elections three weeks away. So we're gonna do trying to do some during election night something. Yeah, man, live, man, live. That, our that first ever good. live. So um, what time's hopefully. that gonna be at, Jay? You don't need to know that, mate. Just, just, just put the next day off work, yeah. All right, okay. <laughs> I've been Scotter. That's been Motta, and we shall see you very soon.